Last time we looked at debugging and simulation. This time we're going to look at doing some timing analysis. Before we start, we might want to change to a release configuration by pressing the pencil icon in the build settings section. Here we can change from debug to release mode by clicking the set active button. Using the release configuration effectively turns on optimization and allows us to see the program running at its best. Press OK to finish. Before we can carry out timing analysis, first ensure that the logging functionality is enabled in the settings. Next we need to look at two settings that affect how timing analysis itself is carried out. Timing data is stored in a buffer whose size is indicated by this parameter. Having a larger buffer means that less time will be taken for the timing analysis, while having a smaller buffer will take less memory but require more time for the same effect. Next we must specify the number of ticks that we wish to carry out timing analysis for. Remember that in this case a tick is 1000 microseconds. Because this is just a demonstration video we're going to shorten this to 100 ticks. This should allow us to see timing analysis working, but without taking too long over it. When we're ready, we can simply click Gather Timing Data from Simulation in the Timing Statistics section. The program must be built before timing analysis can begin. Now we see the buffer of data being acquired. When finished, the overview page is shown. At the top, we can see an overview of the CPU utilization over time. You can see that the 100 ticks we ran for corresponds to 100,000 microseconds. As we can see, the utilization never rises above 25%. This can also be seen in the summary at the bottom left. This pie chart shows that we have 89% idle time. And on the right of the overview page, we can see a summary of the preferences we used, and we have the ability to export all of our data into various formats. These include Excel, rich text, comma separated values, and portable document format. This gives us a nice overview of the system but it doesn't really tell us the specifics of what's going on internally. For that, we can go to the Timing Details tab at the bottom left. At the top right of this page, we can select which units we'd like to see the data in, microseconds or cycles. This affects both of the two graphs below. On these graphs, we can see the stack utilization and the task timing for each task. You might notice that the scale of both of these graphs is the same, from 0 to 200,000 cycles. We can change this directly by changing the value in the text boxes, or we can use the two arrow buttons to move forward a full page, or to move one tick at a time. Ticks are shown as the dotted vertical lines in each of the two graphs. In the bottom graph, we can see exactly which tasks are running at any given time, and exactly how long they ran for. If we zoom in, we can see at a much higher level of detail. In the top graph, we can see every change to the stack pointer over time, including the highest value for each of the two stacks. For example, from this we can tell that from this area of the interrupt stack is exactly when the interrupt handler was happening. And in this section of the main stack usage we can tell that the scheduler was running. And then comparing this to the lower graph we can see exactly where the task ran and its stack usage. It's worth pointing out that the stack usage measurements shown are actually measured at runtime from the simulator. We can compare this data to what we got from our analytics functionality which is measured by static analysis. So 
So at the top of the screen, we can see that we use 264 bytes of interrupt stack and 152 bytes of main stack. In our analytics, our static analysis predicted 264 bytes for the interrupt handler and 152 bytes of main, indicating that we successfully identified the worst case usage. Finally, if you want to see the raw data, this is the data that we acquired directly from the system at runtime. This is broken down by task. I can select any task and see all of the samples and statistics that were gathered for it. Once again, this data can be seen in microseconds or in cycles. If we want to see just how accurate this data is, Let's take a look at the flashing LED task. You can see that this has a start time. It was only sampled once during our 100 tick run. It has a start time of 3,211 cycles, and it's only executed for 15 cycles. Now let's compare this to the listing file to see exactly how accurate it is. We can find the listing file in the project under listings. The listing file shows the actual compiled assembly output from the compiler. If I search for the task, this is the flashing LED task that we just saw. This symbol represents the start. These represent the actual assembly as it's compiled, and the bits in between are the C code that we wrote. If we remove the C code, This is the following task. So this is the actual code, everything that gets compiled for the flashing LED. If we cut this and paste it to the top of the file, you can see that there are exactly 15 lines of assembly code, which corresponds to our 15 cycle execution time perfectly. So the simulator is cycle accurate to what is actually happening in the hardware. At the bottom left of the raw data page, we can see our original estimates for worst case execution time, deadline, and jitter. If you remember, worst case execution time is set in the source code, deadline and jitter are set from the tasks page. But what would we see if we actually exceeded these values? Well, let's try it and find out. In the segment update task, the execution time goes up to 631 cycles. Let's modify the worst case execution time estimate for this task to be lower than that and see what happens. Remember that we can go to the tasks page to view the worst case execution time estimates. Our measured worst case was 631, so let's try setting it to 630. Save, and carry out our timing analysis once more. Once again, it's going to rebuild only the files necessary, and acquire around 6 buffers worth of data. If we go to the problems view, we can now see that we have an error. This will also show up in our Project Explorer. The error shows us that we exceeded our worst case execution time for this task by 8 cycles. If I double click, it takes us directly to the offending piece of code. If we now go back to the statistics, we can see exactly which values exceeded the estimate. 